Thank you, Tim. Thank you for that uh, the kind introduction. Um, what I want to do uh, over the next uh, 50, uh, 60 minutes or so is to give you a satellite view of the work that's been taking place in Ireland over the past 20 years. And essentially, I want to kind of show you the amount of uh, impact that development works can have in terms of positive impact that development works can have on developing and uh, um, increasing our understanding and enhancing understanding of the past. Um, by, uh, shall we say, by virtue of the range of topics, it's going to be quite a rapid run through. So uh, we expect to start in the about 12,000 years ago pre-settlement of the island, and we're going to end up about 150 years ago. So that's the sort of range, sorry, actually about 80 years ago. So that's the range to cover. Uh, by way of background, I just thought I'd give, uh, put up a slide of uh, the sort of typical uh, archaeology of Ireland that we have. These are some of the uh, highlight sites. We've got uh, two world heritage areas, including Skellig Michael there, which is uh, currently in the Star Wars, uh, Star Wars uh, films. It's um, also along with uh, Brunaboni and Newgrange is the other uh, world heritage site. We've also got another 150,000 150, um, archaeological sites on our record monuments and places, our SMR, so to speak, and about 15,000 on our record protected structures. So we've got a, a vast range of known and upstanding uh, monuments dating back from the Mesolithic period when the, uh, the islands were settled, although we'll speak about that a little later on, right up to the um, industrial archaeology as represented in the far slide from the Copper Coast in County Waterford. But my concern is not really with the upstanding archaeology. We generally try to avoid upstanding archaeology wherever possible. Our concern is with the unknown archaeology that we encounter. Just a, a few headlines uh, for you in terms of uh, the uh, TII's work. Um, we do our work really for three basic reasons. One, legislation. It's the law. We have to uh, address archaeology. It's uh, mandatory. Secondly, risk. If we don't address archaeology properly and don't deal with archaeology properly, we can expose uh, the taxpayer to uh, considerable expenditure and considerable delay. And then thirdly, public trust. There's no point us doing a huge amount of work and uh, spending a huge amount of money but not making that work available or not making sure that we've actually got quality work as well. Uh, in terms of the amount of uh, roads uh, Tim just uh, alluded to, the, the, the area highlighted in blue shows about 1,300 kilometres, uh, 1,400 kilometres of uh, new road that's been graded. That's predominantly motorway, but also national uh, primary network, high-quality um, high dual carriageways. In addition, in total, we've got about 5,000 kilometres of national road in the country, so that kind of gives you a sense of the amount of work we have to do. We're also concerned about 35 kilometres of uh, light rail within Dublin, and that work is also underway. Uh, in terms of archaeology, that slide there shows all the uh, archaeological excavations that we've carried out. About 2,500 archaeological excavations have been carried out in the past 20 years, and those cover every, you know, are across the country. And that slide represents the work of tens of companies, um, hundreds and up to thousands of archaeologists have been working on this game in 2007. We had about 1,200, 1,300 archaeologists working in the country uh, during 2007. Lots of specialists, lots of consultants. There's a huge amount of people. And I should say, at the outset, what I'm talking about, I actually excavated none of these sites. None of this is my work at all. This is the work of hundreds of other people. And uh, it's important to recognise that. That's my, shall we say, uh, Trump card and my get-out-of-jail card. Um, a couple of key dates, though, I've put up there in terms of 2007 code of practice. Uh, the code of practice set up our... Um, the terms of engagement, the rules of engagement between the National Roads Authority as it was and the relevant department. And I won't go into the detail of it, but I think it was a, a, an important step in us actually taking on responsible management of archaeology because it meant that the uh, developer, the National Roads Authority, subsequently RPA and subsequently ourselves and TII, had to take account of archaeology from the outset. Another key development I'll just point out is 2004, the National Monuments Act. Up to 2004, the, National Monument, the responsibility for the delivery of archaeological reports in the main was, fell onto the shoulders of the actual archaeological directors themselves. Now, for multi-million euro projects, that's actually, to my mind, an intolerable burden. Um, now it falls on the shoulders of the roads authorities, but also means that, uh, which are essentially county managers, if they uh, chief executives of the local authorities. So if the works aren't done, they can be held to account 
as far as you hold a account manager to account, than is to hold uh, you know, a jobbing archaeologist to account. And I think that's a, a crucial development. Just to give you a sense of, uh, sorry, the those in red, for anybody who's actually um, looking, at, looking at work in Ireland at the moment, those are just areas that we're working currently today uh, and last year. So we've got a, still got a widespread, and those red dots represent projects of uh, minor realignments to 30, 40, uh, 50 kilometer schemes. Kind of work that we're involved in, you can, uh, the, those, the big um, tunnel project you'd expect, also the motorway project and the light rail project, you'll expect us to be involved in those. But we're also involved in things such as the National Cycleway. And we bring our philosophies and our uh, approaches to bear in the National Cycleway. We're also involved in national primary roads which go through historic towns. So that's a, a Butterfield uh, down in County Cork, and we've been responsible for dealing with the archaeology there. So we've got a huge area of responsibility for archaeology. Our generalised philosophy is uh, we're given a mission, build a road, identify a problem, solve a problem essentially. We take into account LIDAR, we take into account the Archaeology Physical Surveys, we do um, mass amount of background research, historical mapping, field walking, etc. We do mass amount of test trenching. We will test up to 12.5%, 15% of a scheme in advance of construction, identify the sites, excavate them as you expect, do our post excavation, create our archive reports. Then also carry on to do our uh, publications. Uh, some of you who came into the room earlier on will have heard uh, some people uh, talking about. Um, oh, there are a series of stories playing. That's one of our audiobooks uh, that we have as fictional accounts of archaeology from uh, Donegal. And we produce audiobooks. We do uh, archaeological um, uh, reconstructions. We do a lot of different work in terms of trying to interpret the past, and that's we see uh, we see that as a key element of the end product of the uh, the end product of these projects. Equally. It's important that we actually take the information we find in our archive reports and feed it back into our future development. So we're continually learning, continually trying to take on board what we know and feed it into the future. So that's the end of the corporate spiel. Um, moving forward into our little tour. Now, I suppose a, a class is a little bit like a Spotify playlist. I've taken 12, 000, uh, two and a half thousand archaeological sites and I've tried to pick the ones that interest me, that excite me, and I hope excite you. And I'd say that if I had my other colleagues were standing here, they might choose one or two to be the same, but they might also choose different stories. And that's something about any of these works, that there's multiple stories, so there's multiple narratives and multiple journeys that you can take through the past. So I'm going to start pre-settlement. Um, as I said, our, it's accepted that archaeology in Ireland uh, started in the Mesolithic period. Uh, however, there are interesting work come from non-NRA, uh, work by Marion O'Dowd and Ruth Carden, that's suggesting that we've actually got Pleistocene settlement. Also, Richard Jennings uh, in Cambridge is suggesting that it's a Pleistocene settlement. We haven't found any evidence of it as of yet in our schemes. What we have found are things such as our uh, friend here, the uh, Great Irish Deer. Um, these are antlers from works in County Meath. They're turned up, antlers have turned up in, and evidence from Pleistocene animals have turned up in Limerick, Cork, Clare, and a variety of other counties. And they're just uh, uh, fantastic objects. They're not archaeological, but they have actually ended up in uh, Kells uh, County Museum, so if you ever have a road there, you can have a look at them. Um, we'll go on to archaeology proper now, the Mesolithic. And so in the Mesolithic, we don't have, uh, a, you know, Mesolithic houses, unlike, say, uh, schemes in the Isle of Man and also schemes in northern England and Scotland, which have revealed Mesolithic settlement. We haven't actually found any Mesolithic settlement. We found pits, we found lith lithic scatters, we found more ephemeral uh, piece of work. However, one site which we have found uh, came up in Clownstown. And it presented itself as this uh, fairly nondescript, and I'm going to use the word nondescript a couple of times tonight, uh, nondescript hump and bump in the field. Where our road is going through it. It was immediately identified as a full fear, which we'll talk on in more detail later on. That's a Bronze Age uh, site. Uh, you can see in the right-hand slide, the mound's been cut through, sectioned, and you've got the upper part of the mound as Bronze Age, Underneath that, there's Neolithic layers, and as they cut away, removed the peat, they came down onto a uh, basketry. And that's on the left hand side. On the right hand side, they excavated around that and they revealed uh, these two uh, fish traps. And they're on a lake shore, or they're on, uh, on an area that was previously a lake, and you can see the uh, white from the marl. That was a lake, that was a lake bed. It was block lifted and, uh, sorry, it was excavated and cleaned out, and in it they found lithics 
They found hazelnut shells. They found a small wooden object which looked like a, a little boat. And they also um, what called, block lifted it and removed it to the lab for excavation. I should say, actually, uh, what I want to do is uh, tease out uh, connections between Ireland and England. And one feature of the work that we've done in Ireland over the past 20 years has been the number of uh, English and British archaeologists who've been working here. So Matt Mossop, who excavated this site, is a, an English archaeologist. And the material here was actually conserved in the Liverpool Conservation Technologies um, the lab there. Fully excavated. And when we look at it, it's reconstructed by J.G. O'Donoghue here. It's got uh, it's a fish basket. And these fish baskets you'll find all over the world. They're conical baskets. You place it in the river, place it in the lake. You channel the fish into them through uh, just uh, weirs or uh, uh, fence posts. Uh, channel it in. You can lift a fish out. They can swim in. They can swim out, and you can catch your fish that way. And we've got examples all over the world. They're a very common response to a, to a common problem. This particular one, I say, is one of the earliest found in Ireland so far. It's actually currently on display in the National Museum and also has been memorialised uh, just recently by uh, on post our Royal Mail as a stamp. Uh, they've got, uh, recently, in the past three weeks, they released a series of uh, their top 100 objects and uh, that one went in as the first one. So we're particularly proud of that. Um, just another thing I'll just point out about the slides I've got tonight. In the bottom you'll see the name of the director, the townland, the actual excavation report and the uh, references. Just in case you, anybody wants to focus in on something, you can do that and the slides will make available as well if anybody wants it. Right, moving to the Neolithic period. We've got, in contrast to the Mesolithic, the Neolithic period, we've got much more archaeology. We've got more settlement, ceremonial, ritual, and we'll just take you through some of that. Firstly, we've got uh, uh, settlement evidence. We've got a couple of sites here from town parks and also uh, Manani and I've also got pottery. Now, the pottery, I'll just tease out, I'm going to refer, return to pottery again and again through the talk. Um, the pottery here was uh, analysed by Jessica Smith and Rich Evershed as part of their shared project, and that idea did a lithic analysis on a range of pottery, and we were able to contribute quite a bit of it from various sites that we've been involved in excavating, and it was, they were able to do live analysis, which revealed that daring had come in from the earliest part of the Neolithic so that you've got a daring economy. And that has helped us build up um, our understanding past. And here's a, a reconstruction by Dan Teach Tyler of uh, the town parks uh, site. So you've got your house, rectangular house. You've got a bar or a barn. You have a bar or a barn. You've also got some small rectangular fields enclosed, your cattle and other domestic works taking place. And that was done between the Von Witte and uh, Dan working together. Another side of deal with is a site which has actually featured here in the the uh, Royal, uh, Royal Archaeological Institute, is uh, Mara Boy. And I know there is a debate here between Alison Sheridan and Alistair Whittle. I'm not going to take sides in the debate, um, but obviously I prefer an earlier date to a later date. Um, one thing about it is that we have actually found in other road schemes in uh, Sligo, other dates that are coming in, which are suggestive of an earlier date. And it's mentioned that we'll be uh, a learning organisation. And one thing that we do over the years, we look at the work that we're, that's been done and with our sites that are now being excavated, we would tend to take out more, we'd be looking for a far greater number of radiocarbon dates than we would have done previously. So if we were to excavate Maraboy again, we'd probably be able to answer the question with more certainty. Another thing about it, sir, that's the, uh, the causeway enclosure there. And I should say it's the, for anyone who isn't familiar with Maraboy, there's only two causeway enclosures in Ireland, and uh, this is one of them that came up. So it is, regards to it, it's still a significant uh, discovery. Um, we also had, uh, again, when we go back and look at our work, um, we commissioned James Bonsall and the University of Bradford to review all of our archaeological geophysical work that took place in the 2000s. And as part of that work, James went back to Marha Boy and carried our work outside the, uh, outside the Atlantic, just in this area here. And he identified just a plot here, and he included, identified this little structure down here, a four-post structure. So the actual, it would actually be sitting there if you know what I mean. And again, it's something that we would actually spend quite a bit of time doing. We can't step outside the Atlantic, we can't excavate, we can't follow uh, the line, we can't follow the mysteries outside. We've got to actually always work within, but we can use geophysical work, we can use other methods to see what's taking place outside. But if we want to go back, I don't know if the RAA sponsors grants, does it? Okay. Um, another thing that we have uh, that comes up in terms of ritual and ceremonial, are these uh, timber enclosures, uh, post, uh, post circles. 
And we've got numerous of these throughout Irish prehistory. And we'll see, again, examples of these. This is from uh, Comainham in County Meath. And I'll just draw attention to two things. Again, the four-post structure. We mentioned four, uh, you know, four-post structure earlier on uh, in Maharboy. Another four-post structure here. And again, on our uh, uh, sites, we're continually finding this sort of motif. Four-post structure, timber enclosures, uh, post enclosures. And we're going to see that repeated again through prehistory. And just to finish up in the Neolithic, I thought I'd uh, bring along some passage to Mart. Now, interestingly, the passage to Mart that we're seeing here hasn't got, none of these sites have, uh, are from Neolithic contexts. These are all actually found early medieval contexts where the stone has been reused. So over on the left-hand side, that's the uh, stone from um, Les Mullen. It was a capstone for a souterrain. And it looks like a curbstone that you get outside of Ukraine. You know, it's, of that, it's just very comfortable within that. We've also got from other souterrains in County Louth into Titra and Bar Newtown Bar Regan, we've got these um, passenger marks being reused. And again, it's a sense that the past is continually being reused and sites again are being revisited. There's awareness of the past. And we're going to see that repeated right the way through. If we move to the Bronze Age, we find uh, it's a very rich period for us. Um, we've got some tremendous, uh, tremendous, tremendous artifacts have come up. I'm just going to point out a couple. Firstly, uh, another connection between Ireland and, uh, and England is the it's the, what you call it, this little uh, top. It's a cap, but it's a gold button cover, and it's from uh, Radley in Berkshire. Or, sorry, there's this parallel to it in Radley in Berkshire. Likewise, we've got these razors in the uh, lower left-hand image. They're from Peafield and Limerick. We've got another one of these uh, stone uh, alignment, or these uh, timber posts alignments uh, from uh, Kerry. And again, it's got a very strong, uh, you know, fixed uh, Bronze Age date. Pottery. I mentioned the pottery in the Neolithic. In the Bronze Age, we've got a pottery's ubiquitous. We're getting pottery from virtually all of our sites. Uh, two examples here we've got from Neorath, incredibly fine urn uh, came from Neorath. And then we've also got a particularly uh, unusual object, um, which is a face cup, which to my knowledge has no parallels in anywhere in either Britain, Ireland, or Europe. Um, and I think that that's a, a unique object and is worthy of a lecture in its own right on its own. Uh, Another thing we've found, of course, we've got metalwork coming in here in the Bronze Age. And this is a site, this is spearhead from Mullamass in County Kildare. That spearhead um, was excavated by uh, Rubicon in the Corsair Works. And they went and actually carried out some experimental archaeology to see about recasting it or casting a replica. And that's the image that you see behind, just out of focus. That's actually a replica image that they came up with. And it's something that we've used, again, I've spoke to them about interpretation be through audio guides, through the images that you see. We're also doing interpretation through uh, experimental archaeology, trying to see, can we understand exactly what's going on? Settlement, there's a huge amount of settlement turning up. Again, this is a Ballon Brownie Lower. And in this case, we actually were able to, as we did with Maro Boy, um, worked at, did work outside the Atlantic to try to get a feel for what was going on. And here you've got quite a, a comprehensive village of enclosure, you know, of uh, houses and enclosures so, uh, in there. That's a, another uh, reconstruction from uh, Digital Archaeology, a German company, again showing this, uh, this enclosed landscape. And back to Clownstown for a second. This is our, our Folk Fia. And Folk Fia comes from a um, is reference to hunting sites. So in our uh, legends in Ireland, we're referring to the, the Folk Fia being referred to as the hunting sites. And as an archaeological monument, they turn up like this. And you're assumed initially that they were related to uh, Iron Age and date. On excavation, they've been revealed to be um, what called Bronze Age, and they essentially comprise of a horseshoe shape of mound, a uh, horseshoe shaped mound with a, a waterline trough, a waterproof trough, and hearth, and for heating uh, heating water. So, from Sonne in County uh, Mayo, you've got the actual mound and the trough, and there's the actual trough turned up there. That, in that case, it's wood lined. In another case, we've actually found clay lined troughs. And that would be the typical image uh, of it, Ferguson Island's image of a uh, trough. Joints of meat being cooked. Personally, I think the idea of boiling meat when you could roast it, you know, I, I don't like the idea of it. But uh, other interpretations, or sorry, probably that, at this site, we've also found some quite uh, unusual objects can turn up at the site. And for engineers, they loathe full of fears. Because full of fears are so ubiquitous, you find them in every single scheme. So they say, well, sure, you never get anything interesting from them. 
Well, actually, in this one from Sun of five, 5, which is literally just beside Sun of 4, uh, we found this biconical tin bead, which actually has a uh, parallels, no other parallels in Ireland, but has parallels from Flag Fen, so that there's an object in Flag Fen which looks somewhat similar. Other interpretations from the cooking meat interpretation are that they're sweat houses or saunas. And here you've got Liam Hackett um, has identified one from uh, Ballyburn Lower. And he's quite simply suggests that the main trough would have been filled with water. Water, it's clay lined and then surrounded with a, um, a structure uh, to allow for a sauna to build up. And we get actual ethnographic versions of these right, right through history with sweat houses turning up in a, a much later dates. And then we've got the burnt mound in the background. Another interpretation, depending, again, this interpretation is purely on the basis of the intercutting ditches and pits. So you've got all these pits, which all have, are all contemporary from the dates of recent contemporary, but have been interpreted as um, being a fulling site for the treatment of, um, of uh, fleeces, and for cleaning and treatment of fleeces. There's no actual evidence from the site to, su to suggest that it is what it was, other than the configuration of the, um, the ditches. From the side we found a spade is identified here, a little shovel head, and an antler pick as well turned up. So other interpretations that have come across have been brewing, have been butchering, uh, have been leather work, have been for flax, uh, treated with a flax. Numerous, uh, numerous interpretations have uh, come up for these site types. So we'll just leave the, the Bronze Age and move to the Iron Age. Now, when I was in college, back in the late 80s, early 90s, the Iron Age was always uh, accompanied by words sort of elusive, enigmatic, mysterious. And uh, Katrina Becker, uh, in work she's done with uh, Anine Armand and Graham Swindle, in their work they refer to the Art Iron Age has posed even more basic questions, many of which could hardly be addressed due to the simple lack of data. Um, and that's from a book that uh, they're going to be publishing with us later on in the year. And this is just a distribution map of settlement sites and rural sites. And there are also um, artefacts as well, but it's quite sparse. Their work, based on just the radio carbon dates, has identified a much richer uh, around, uh, amount of dates that are firmly tied to the, uh, firmly tied to the Iron Age. Um, we're contributing approximately 60 to 70% of those dates are coming from road schemes. Um, and you can see there are the M3, the N9 and 10, the M17, the M6, and so on. You know, they're actually being picked out in the landscape. So some of those are enigmatic and mysterious and elusive, well, I think development-led uh, development, uh, work can help to address those questions. And what are we seeing when we find the Iron Age? Well, this is actually one of my favourite sites of all, Edercloon, uh, Katrina Moore's excavations in Longford. It actually can fit, uh, this site, Edercloon, again deserves a lecture in its own right. It can fit into Neolithic, it can fit into um, Bronze Age, Iron Age, um, and even into early medieval. I'm just focusing on artefacts, on this, uh, these two uh, features here. This is an Iron Age platform, and this uh, trackway here is a late Iron Age, uh, sorry, late Bronze Age, early Iron Age feature. And it's actually got dates right way through. It doesn't cease. There's no clear distinction between Bronze Age dates and Iron Age dates. Uh, material we came from it, spearheads, wheels, very unusual mallet. And also this, the wooden bowl there in the lower right-hand corner. I mentioned the fact that pottery was important in prehistory. Well, we saw it in the Neolithic. We saw it in the Bronze Age. In the Iron Age, and even in the early medieval, pottery has gone from the record. We don't have pottery. For some reason, this society has decided we're not going to use pottery. I don't know what, why. Perhaps the fact that we've got wooden bowls such as that is the answer. But pottery is gone as a, a, a for vessels completely. Um, we have at the time um, interactions in the Iron Age interactions with uh, the rest of Europe and Britain. These uh, are some um, objects which are the object on the far left. Is, is a brooch inspired from a Latin design that was found in a hill fort in uh, Galway. The uh, spearhead be uh, below is a Roman inspired spearhead. And then there's a swan neck pin, also from a typical Iron Age date that was found in Ireland. So we have got material coming in from uh, overseas, and we've also got people within Ireland making their own material inspired by other material from uh, abroad. Iron working, we've got all aspects of the iron working from our charcoal, uh, what do you call from our. Um, uh, excavations under bogs to get into bog ore from our uh, what you call it, charcoal production pits, from our smelting sites, from our smithing. Here are a couple of smelting uh, uh, smelting sites um, furnaces in a shaft furnace from Grange, and I think what's interesting about shaft furnace means they are working in clay. They're fully aware of their properties of clay, so 
to actually go from making a shaft furnace or to making a pot. There would be no uh, difficulty whatsoever to do that, but they're choosing not to do it. Uh, we've also got in uh, Nakamon just a uh, furnace site which is actually surrounded and has been interpreted as being um, underneath the structure. Went back to the start, we've talked about settlement. Well, here we've got settlement from uh, Money, uh, Money Law and Lower, um, Lee McKinstry's work there, Valerie J. Keeley, and it shows a number of uh, Iron Age houses, all closely dated. You can see there 210 to 240 BC, 370 to 170 BC, 360 to 50 BC, and it's also identified uh, kilns as well. So we are actually beginning to uh, pick out, and around the country we're beginning to pick out Iron Age settlements, actual Iron Age houses. And here we've got, uh, going to our ceremonial site, we've got uh, Ring Ditch. Again, very closely dated, this from Galway, um, very closely dated, La last century uh, BC, first century AD, a Ring Ditch. And from that Ring Ditch, and there are two Ring Ditches here in Galway, we got these uh, beautiful uh, glass beads which have par parallels with uh, Mayor and Somerset. And we also have um, this fantastic object. It's uh, about the size of a domino. And actually it's got even a, probably not too dissimilar uh, uh, to a domino with the uh, five and six there. On all the sides though, it's actually got numbers. It's got, uh, this, it's got incisions on all the sides. So it's a die, and that's that bone die which has been uh, badly burnt, um, probably during cremation. That's got parallels in Ireland, England, and Scotland. It certainly sits very comfortable with examples from Loch Crewe. And then, uh, another national monument we found, this is from uh, Lis Mullen. And remember, I referred to before about the Neolithic uh, stone from Lis Mullen, which turned up in uh, the suturing. The suturing will be up here. This is our large enclosure, and it's picked up by the people. When that site has been excavated, we had 150 archaeologists working on that site at the time. And then you've got an inner enclosure, and you've also got a, an avenue, a wooden avenue. Again, that sense of avenues, wooden enclosures, turning up and being repeated in quite different cultural contexts, but we're seeing it again throughout prehistory. Uh, this one is as an alignment on the stars, uh, on the Pleiades, on the con Pleiades constellation there. That avenue is actually aligned on the con constellation. So now move to the er early medieval period. Again, when I was in college, the early medieval period, we understood the early medieval period, absolutely. Settlement was in ring forts or cashels. So the ring forts are up there, the raths. Your castles of stone uh, built ring fort or crown oaks for the wealthy. And then if there was religious, they had ecclesiastical settlements which sometimes ended up becoming proto-towns. Uh, that was the, uh, an accepted model. In the 90s, we suddenly started discovering not just on road schemes, but on large schemes, other type of settlements came up. And these were became uh, known as fertha or cemetery settlements. And just picked up a few. There's one that was found in 2003 in Johnstown. And you should be able to see here this, uh, the red circle there. That's uh, delineating a mound, uh, the remains of a mound, the uh, excavator Linda Clark noted. And at the centre of that was a charnel uh, pit with um, the remains of, I think it was about 20, 30 individuals, uh, disarticulated remains, partially burnt, and all come back with a very, very tight Iron Age date. Now that site, sort of burial there, then burial moved to this quadrant here from throughout the medieval period. So right way through the medieval, early medieval period into the late medieval period. And burial continued on right over here when there was actually in the 17th, 18th, 19th, and up to 20th century when there were actual um, infants buried there as part of a children's <coughs> burial ground. It's a phenomenon in, in Ireland for children who died before baptism. Uh, they would be buried in, uh, say, they could be buried in Churches, churchyards, but it could be buried in sacred spaces by the community. And here we have that. And I actually remember when that scheme was being done, um, I went and I spoke to the grandmother of the landowner, and she told me about um, how a sister's, uh, fr her friend's sister was actually buried there. So you've got this sense within the landscape of, uh, like I call it, stepping stones from the Iron Age to the, mo or to the modern period, not the early modern period, to the modern period, going right the way through. Uh, interesting folk memory, and we're seeing that pattern repeated again and again around Ireland. Uh, more cemetery settlements, turning up here just from uh, Karakil and Rup uh, excavated in Galway. And actually, by the way, this one here in the centre, that was just finished up excavation about two months ago. So we're still working on sites like these right at the, at the moment, and that came from a scheme 
about a, a scheme which is about three or four hundred meters in length. This is what they look like, and uh, or so this is what their interpreter looked like. Uh, this is by um, the interpreter by Teach Tyler, and you can see banked enclosure, settlement, and fields, and then delineating from the, from the surrounding landscape. Material getting a wide range of material: pins, brooches, and of course burials. One of the moves shifts to, uh, uh, focus slightly now to the ecclesiastical side. So we've looked at our settlement, our cemetery settlements, we're going to look at the ecclesiastical side and just one object here. And this is Clonfadden County, West Meath. And on this site, we found a, uh, an abundance of, of um, fragments, of metalworking fragments, tons of it, literally uh, tons of metalworking fragments and uh, slag and so on. We also found these strange shr uh, shrouds. And nobody's quite sure what they were. And just notice these, the, this one here, which had the two holes there and the line there. And that was interpreted as being a shroud for a bell, for a metal object, uh, for a bell which would be folded over. You'd have your rivets there. You'd then be, um, from following lipid analysis, they uh, would have been, what called wrapped in a, a, a hessian soaked with abrasion chemicals, fired. Once it was fired, you get that characteristic, the shroud, uh, fragments of the shroud, and then you get the actual bell at the end. And the purpose for doing that was to actually enrich and enhance the uh, tonal qualities of the bell. So it comes across, and rather than having quite a flat sound when you get from an iron bell, that gives you a much richer, much deeper sound. Um, unfortunately, what's going to bring, we have a replica of it. This is a, a project we did with National Museum of Wales, uh, GeoArc and VJK, Dollar J. Keeley Limited. I was going to bring it along with me, but I thought that it might be difficult to explain to. Um, to customs, um, that it was an object, but it wasn't an object. Um, it's a it's a superb thing. The uh, it's a superb object. And it's an interesting way of uh, doing work. Uh, Paul Stevens, the director, has interpreted the site as being actually a bell manufactory. He feels that the amount of bell fragments that he got were too much for one site alone. You don't need that many bells on one site. So he would actually uh, liken it to a uh, almost like a scriptorum, but have it for um, for bell manufacturing. And of course, Clonfad happens to be in the centre of the country, and those are the, bell, those are the sites which have bells all around it. And interestingly, we've got uh, references in the annals of the Four Masters, um, and also in the life of St. Colman, who's a founding saint, that the hereditary stewards of this particular monastery were blacksmiths. So, there another ecclesiastical site uh, that I'm going to refer to uh, before we leave the early medieval period is uh, Cobegley Mill. At this mill site, uh, which is just in County Roscommon, we had a road going right through the bottom of the valley and the churchyard was at the top. Uh, we came across this inc very fine uh, structure. Um, it's the undercroft of a, uh, of, a, of a mill. You can see there the sluice going down. So the water would have been here, sluice would have come down here and directed in here. And what I want to draw your attention to is the actual wheel hook here. This is the wheel hook and I would have sat just in the centre there. Originally we thought that the water would have come onto that straight. Um, come out of the wheel, uh, the, the sluice, and come straight at it. But examining it, realised that probably not. And probably what we're doing is the water is actually going to the onto the dome here, onto the bell shape here. And as the, the water hit the bell, it then meant to increase the amount of force that went onto the paddles that was going round. And we found multiple different types of paddles on the site. So it wasn't all one type of paddle. It meant that they could actually control the speed of the stone for grinding the corn here. So. Uh, by changing the paddle types. Well, and uh, they could take them out and put them in as required. Interesting if we could get a, an experiment, uh, try to do that with an experimental archaeology on that. Now, move again to the medieval period. And for us, the medieval period, we take it from the uh, time of Anglo-Norman colonisation, um, following a lot of literature. Uh, here, we found these uh, uh, sites, these are motor sites. And I'm going to talk about these sites because they are sites which came in with the Anglo-Normans, and they date to the sort of 13th, 14th century. Um, the types that we have, you know, they're rural farmsteads, quite different to the previous Irish farmsteads, which are uh, circular or uh, suboval, and you've got your houses, uh, rectangular houses, buyers, etc. in them. Material that you're getting, you're getting pottery, and we're getting extensive quantities of pottery. We're also getting imported pottery. Um, here we're getting Santange, there's a cork ware, and there's also ham green bee ware. So pottery's coming into the record. Another site from Coolamurray, uh, where we've got a 
the remains of a uh, Grace Fagan the director has interpreted this as being a drawbridge and she's identified we've got, uh, on the site again the material came from it um, pottery uh, dividers and also very well you know finally made uh, quern stones uh, interestingly when we talk about think about the people who actually lived in the site Mark Gardner and Ty Keith would have considered this area and uh, Kieran Connor would have considered this area to be uh, the equivalent of the immigrants who came over with originally with the Anglo-Norman colonisation, or else their descendants, so that you've got people coming over and they'd be free tenants, so they'd be prosperous, and they would liken them to the uh, artisans in the urban areas. That you've actually got people who are very wealthy, but not they're they're wealthy within their within their class. Another site we've got from the medieval period is Ballyhanna. This is a site we excavated up in uh, Donegal, and. It's a churchyard which literally was lost. Uh, it's crossed over from the house. The people had no notion that it, it, it was there. We found several hundred um, what do you call burials there. When we analysed those burials, um, they provided a and it was done through was a research project with uh, Queen's University of Belfast, IT Sligo, Donegal County Council, and ourselves. When we analysed the burials, um, there was a lot of ancient DNA work done on them, and that ancient DNA uh, research fed into a project in the University of Wisconsin, which was uh, able to, uh, which is studying cystic fibrosis. Now Ireland has one of the highest rates of cystic fibrosis in Western Europe. And that cystic fibrosis um, has traditionally been thought to be always be, be within the population in Ireland. That's always been there. The Ballyhanna work allowed us to actually go in there and look at the, uh, uh, the various uh, ideals, um, the ge ge genetic markers, and identify that actually this population had a lower incidence of cystic fibrosis than the, the modern population, and therefore it actually supports the hypothesis that uh, cystic fibrosis, the genetic mark of cystic fibrosis, came in um, in the 17th century when there was a tuberculosis pl uh, plague, there was an outbreak of tuberculosis. So it shows how the kind of work that can be done can contribute not just to our understanding in archaeological terms, but also to our medical understanding. There's other objects there, small spear, uh, small arrowhead. Uh, cross-shaped pottery and a small a little, a little bell there. Moving to Dublin and moving to one of our light rail projects, here we can't do our big trenches as we do in advance. We have to uh, use uh, the opportunities provided by, afforded by enabling works. And this is Trinity College Dublin, immediately outside Trinity College Dublin, very historic part of the city. And um, actually, it's interesting enough, uh, Trinity College was given endowed originally by Queen Elizabeth, so um, Queen Elizabeth I. Uh, in here, or immediately outside, you've got a part of the city which is, has got Viking, it's got, um, I call it, there's a monastery, and it's also got Tudor uh, activity all taking place in one area. Uh, when these uh, burials came up in the work, uh, they were, no one was quite sure which way they were going to date it. They were eventually dated to the Tudor period, and they were sent to the face lab in Liverpool, John Moore University, and based on typical Irish colouring, um, he was able, they were the specialists there were able to uh, reproduce him. Also based on the skeletal evidence, they would say that he was from a uh, lower class, he was hard working, had lived an active life, uh, uh, manual labour. So therefore, rather than putting him into two refinery, they put him into a much uh, more simpler cloth. Uh, his hairstyle and beard are inspired by Lucas de Heer's uh, images of 16th century, um, <coughs> called, uh, 16th century uh, people, Irish people. So interesting one. So now we're going to move again rapidly in time to the uh, 17th century. And here I'm going to focus in on just a couple of days, about a month in total. Uh, just like Britain, in, when you had the Civil War taking place here, in Ireland the, there was a, there was a um, civil war, there was, an, there was a civil disturbance, so to speak, there was a rebellion, and there was a Confederacy of Kilkenny was established in 1641. And through the 1640s, the armies actually uh, exchanged sides. So you had alliances formed and uh, reformed in different ways and different permutations. But at the time of 1642, this is from a, a map from the 1650s, you had Dublin, town, city here, Dalkey here, and the Dublin Mountains down here. And this area was uh, described, shall I say, in the Dublin Mountains and the mountains to the south, in Wicklow, the Dublin Mountains, the Wicklow Mountains, that was held, areas held by the, uh, the Irish, by Confederates, and had traditionally been held by, our, by the Irish. And to the north, you had uh, 
areas of land which had been held by the English settlers. And you had a lot of conflict. This is a border zone. Uh, in 1640s, there was an ambush in February 12th, we should say. There was a, an ambush, a massacre here, uh, depending on your point of view, in Dean's Grange, when Confederate uh, forces uh, were um, beaten by uh, government forces. They all uh, retreated, moved, they, sorry, they then fortified various castles in that area, in that, con that contested area, including one at Carrick Mines. Okay. The government forces were concerned that they were actually uh, now occupying positions because they're occupying positions in this, in this, shall I say, contested territory. And they said uh, that uh, they were going in there. They were concerned that they could hinder uh, our markets and to cut off as such as we should send abroad. And that's from the actual government papers at the time. So they decided to march under Simon Harcourt on the uh, March 24th. Um, they decided to march a large force of 800 um, Flintlock so soldiers, Flintlocks, uh, down two carrot mines to uh, uh, lay siege to it. And they described the uh, defenders began to give reproachful signs to Harcourt's men from the top of the castle. I'm not sure what a reproachful sign is, but we can kind of imagine that it's not uh, particularly welcoming. And uh, again, that's from Borlasi, that was from 1680, so that's a, a historical, historical account of it, 40 years after the event. Uh, Owen uh, gives a, um, account, a contemporary account of, of it. A fire is lit on the battlement of the castle. And when he says the fire is lit on the battlement of the castle, he also goes on to say that a fire, there was a responding fire from the mountains. So you can imagine these are the mountains here. And actually the landscape here is, uh, that illustration doesn't do it justice, that it's quite a rough, um, we've got high, high ground to the south, and the area isn't flat, it's quite rough, there's a lot of uh, interlocking hills there. Not an easy area to defend or to control. Apparently the uh, soldiers and the, uh, in the mines tried to uh, break out, they were unable to break out. And uh, in, in the course of the siege, it's only lasting day, we're only talking about Sunday, the uh, uh, March 24th. Uh, Simon, Harcourt, so Simon Harcourt is killed, and a number of his soldiers are killed, and then that motivates his troops who fall on the, uh, with exceeding great fierceness to the castle and with axes break open the gate. And that's from the Ormond manuscript. Again, govern, govern side. Um, now we're going to get into it. 200 men, 200 and odd men, women and children were killed. Contemporary account from Owen. 300 persons described dead from Ormond. The opposition say, all but two defenders escaped. But that hundreds of Harcourt's troops were killed in the failed assault. So, uh, Let's see what archaeology can say. And then it goes on to say, blew up the castle with powder as a mark of terror to the rebels. Uh, and again, that's what the government side is saying. So we've got an event taking place in the 1640s for multiple points of view. And we then go on in the 1650s, during the, the, uh, sorry, the during the down survey, when they're actually documenting, and Sir William Petty is documenting all the lands in Ireland that are going to be confiscated. And it's, a, it's a, an amazing project that he did. Uh, they say they stands only the walls of a fair stone house which are in Carrick, Maine, or on Carrick, Maine. So that's uh, a contemporary account of what happened 10 years afterwards, what we're seeing in Carrick, Maine. So the blowing up, the uh, sundering of the walls, that's probably correct. Now, where does this fit in with us? Well, we're building a motorway in the early 2000s, started in, 19, in the late 90s, and it's going through this area. We know that there's a, a record of a castle in Carrick, Mines, but nobody actually knows what kind of castle it is. Um, either before or indeed since. And when we, you can just see in the left-hand image all the area that's actually been excavated. If we go on, the uh, extent of the castle, we know this is a multi-period site. Again, I keep talking about multi-period sites. We've got prehistoric activity here. We've got early medieval activity. We've got medieval activity. We've also got this upstanding, sorry, it ends up as, a, as just a farmyard at the end. This is the only part of that structure that is surviving. So we've got a farmyard that you can see previous photographs and you've got this wall. That's, that's Caramine's Castle. We also know that there's very, very significant ditches, and you can see these fosses here. Those are absolutely massive fosses. So the farmyard's in here, and then these are ditches, just to give you a sense of scale. These are massive ditches. We don't actually know what Caramine's was. We don't know if it was a command and control centre, or whether it was a refuge. It will certainly act as a refuge, which would allow people to, to retreat in, but it could equally have been a, a place to launch attacks from uh, through its life. But let's return to the massacre. 
And in total, we found 18 burials in two pits. And we found a number of uh, coins, all dated, you know, you know, either contemporary or earlier. We found muskets, uh, we found a small number of musk balls, including that one impacted musk ball, and we found me firing mechanisms from various guns. But does that represent 300 casualties? You know, it's, it's hard to say. And this is actually one of the problems that we have with the work that we do. Um, there's a limitation. We can only excavate what we're impacting upon. We can't excavate everything, and we can't follow. We can't follow everything. So here is the road as built. That's where the farmyard is. The burials would have been found in this area here, and you'd have had the, the big, uh, shall we say, fosses would have been down here. So again, it's one of the limitations. We can't actually tell what's exactly, we can't answer the story as to what's happening there. And it's a, it's a common feature. Um, so we'll just leave the post made period and we'll head on down to the early modern period. And during the early modern period, we're going back to Dublin city. And this is a map from the 18th century. Uh, the city is growing, it's expanding. Um, the area we're interested in is sitting there up the top, just under the cartouche. And it's at the point in the middle of the uh, 18th century, it's fields and it's also got a, um, houses along the side. 50 years later, the landscape has radically changed. Uh, in 1796, we get uh, that aqueduct, aqueduct you can see. And actually, just as you see that, those uh, hills in the distance, they're the, they're the Dublin Wicklow Mountains. So Carrick Mines would actually be in about here. You know, so we're in that landscape, so you've got these big prominences behind you. Um, the Foster's Aqueduct there is built. We've got a canal coming down in. This is linking into the raw, linking to raw canal, and to the south of that we've got the markets in Smithfield. So bringing, yeah, right, bringing material in from outside in the city in would have come in through the canal. We've also got a in the course of the early part of the um, 19th century we've got the construction of institutional aspects of Dublin. We've got Richmond Penitentiary built there, and fun enough there's models all over Ireland uh, similar to this in terms of ground plan. We've got Queen's Inns, the Law Library. We've also got uh, the Workhouse. Various other uh, government institutions are being built. Um, for an exercise, what I want you to do is focus in on this field here, and particularly this wall. I'll explain why. In the 1830s, uh, cholera arrives in the city. We get a cholera epidemic. Uh, 30,000 people die in Ireland as a, uh, a, a, in total. About 30,000 are according to told in 1832. In Dublin, there's about 10,000 people are actually uh, infected and uh, 6,000 die. They're buried in a cholera hospital, or sorry, they're treated originally in a cholera hospital. The, cholera, the um, graveyard that's associated with a cholera hospital in Bullies Acre is overflows, can no longer handle it. So they uh, press into service to Richmond Penitentiary. And that becomes a cholera hospital uh, to accept the uh, overflow uh, of uh, uh, patients, so to speak. The casualties are buried in this area here, in this field here, and there are about 3,000 or so buried in here. So we've got two burial grounds, essentially. When our works are going along for Lewis Cross City, um, we're expecting along that, um, along that wall I described earlier on, and we come across 30 or 40 burials all along that wall, which are quite clearly associated with the, um, with the collar burial ground. However, we're going to flip back to the, 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 um, shall see, the history of the area here. We've got that field still there, that's the one I'm talking about. The harbour, just from the 1840s, the harbour is still there, and we have what's called the Broadstone Terminal. 20 years later, the, uh, sorry, I should say, at this time, the harbours, the ports in 1840s are sold to the railway. The canals which have come into existence in the late 18th century or 19th century have only had a, li a life span of less than 30 years. And now they're being sold to the Midland Great Rail Railway. Midland Great, Great, Great uh, Western Railway has to keep it open for a number of years. They put in a lovely pneumatic bridge. But then in the 1870s, they need to expand. The harbour is completely infilled. The canals in filled as well, and they expand, uh, they expand it. And then they put in this new engine shed, turning circle. And you can see that wall which I described earlier on. That's, that's still there, and there's another wall put into one side. And this is what happened to those bodies. They basically cut uh, a series of very long trenches along the length of those walls, 
and he just piled in the bodies. There was no care, there was no attention. It was just dig them up, dump them in. And we found over uh, 1,800 skulls. Uh, funnily enough, we didn't actually find a similar number of uh, mandibles, and we feel the mandibles were just were uh, dropped away or fell away, were discarded. But they were just stuffed in there, and stuffed is the only word you can use. Um, the one line is actually abs you know, absolutely appalling. Um, it is of the time, of course. We found a, a grave slab there, and there's great excitement by Mark Morhen, who actually took many of these photographs, uh, who's the expedition director, um, found it. We thought that it would be revealing about the whole lot. But it's just, it's poignant for one person. Here lies here the remains of Anthony Dunleavy, who died 20th of July, 1832. This small tribute affection is directed to his memory by his beloved wife, Jane Dunleavy. Of course, his beloved wife would never have expected that uh, the, her husband would be dumped unceremoniously into a pit like that. And then there's, there's the, the photograph. So that's the lane where we're working in. This is the, uh, uh, what you call it, the, the grave cuts from the 1832, which are quite respectfully done. And then these are the long trenches, which are anything but respectful in the way that they treat the dead. Uh, two artifacts, we found quite a few artifacts here, but I just thought I'd throw two. One, a uh, button from uh, the jacket or coat of a Midland Great Western Rail worker. And also a bone, uh, another bone die, uh, which turned up uh, a lot of, uh, many years after our original one. Postscript to this is that, uh, up until recently, this was actually the, this is a back street lane for gardens. So those cottages all had their little allotments in here and were growing their potatoes and their vegetables were growing in here. Um, they also, what you call it, uh, despite the, 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 you know, the desire for the railway to um, take over and do all the damage in the 1870s, the railway itself went out of existence in the 1930s. So from a, a, a person speaking uh, in a transport agency, this is quite a, a salutary tale, a cautionary tale, I should say. Um, so that brings us to the end of our whistle stop tour ish satellite tour of uh, Irish archaeology and prehistory from our perspective. Um, I suppose going back to this map, 2,500 and counting, because like even today there are archaeologists working on these schemes at the moment. They're working in like Lewis Cross City, they're working in those various uh, areas around the country. And what we're seeing is this has been a, a massive undertaking in the past 20 years um, and a massive amount of collaboration between a lot of different people from the individual individual excavators and you can imagine that when you look at those red uh, those yellow circles they represent an archaeologist in every single field across the island almost from Dublin to Galway going in a radio pattern that there are people in there looking searching whose sole job is to find archaeology and his sole job is there to bring the archaeology out uh, to research, to carry out their own research, to carry out their own uh, exploration, to test out their own ideas. We've then got countless specialists working on it. We're, I've t tipped off a number of um, universities who we're dealing, we've got research projects with going along the way, all building up a collective model, a baseline knowledge, so that anybody coming back to look at Irish archaeology in the next 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, I would expect one of their starting point is going to be the material that's coming from our schemes because it creates this baseline data um, that I think some paralleled in Ireland and certainly I'm incredibly proud of the work that we've done and also the work that's been done um, by all the people there. Um, with that, I'd just like to thank you. If you've got any questions, I'll take those. Uh, I'll just throw in at the end just a uh, reference, a couple of things. We've got over 30 books have been published today. I've actually, we've got 34 books published. We have another 10 currently for production next three years, and sorry, next four years, we've got another 10, and we've got another 20 on top of that to be published down the line. So we're keeping our publication going. We've got a, a project with the Literature Repository of Ireland, and in May 2017, we're going to be launching it with uh, 1,500 reports, our great literature reports will be available online, our audio guides, our YouTube clips, and our papers from our monographs, we've got our audio guides, and we've got a YouTube channel there as well. And take my email address, contact me if there's anything you want in particular. So, thank you.